Hello everyone and welcome back to the Library of Arbalorn. Today we'll be reading chapter 36 of the Witch Song of Shannara. Let's begin. It was as if the world had fallen away. There was only the mist. Moon, stars, and sky had vanished. Forest, trees, mountain peaks, ridge lines, valleys, rocks, and streams were all gone. Even the ground over which Bren ran was a dim and shapeless thing. Its grass is a part of the shifting gray haze. She was alone in the vast and empty void into which she had fled. She stumbled to a weary halt, her arms folding tightly against her body, the sound of her breathing harsh and ragged in her ears. For a long time, she stood within the haze and did not move, only vaguely aware even now that she had become turned about in her flight from the bottom land and run into old and more. Her thoughts scattered like brown leaves, and though she snatched frantically at them, trying to hold them back and gather them together, they were lost almost instantly. A single clear hard image remained fixed before her eyes, a spider gnome, twisted, broken, and lifeless. Her eyes closed against the light and her hands clasped into fists of rage. She had done what she said she would never do. She had taken another human life, wrenching it away in a frenzy of fear and anger, using the wish song to do it. Alanin had warned her that it could happen. She, she could hear the whisper of his caution, Veil Girl. The wish song is power like nothing that I have ever seen. The magic can give life, and the magic can take life away. But I would never use it. The magic uses all, Dark Child, even you. It was the Grimpom's warning and not Alanin's that mocked her now, and she thrust it from her mind. She straightened. It was not as if she had not known somewhere deep within that she might someday be forced to use the wish song's magic as Alana had warned. She had recognized the possibility from the moment he had shown her the extent of its power, and that simple demonstration of the trees intertwined in the forests of the ruined mountains. It was not as if the death of the spider gnome came as some shocking, unexpected revelation. It was the fact that some part of her had enjoyed what she had done, that some part of her had actually taken pleasure in the killing. That horrified her. Her throat tightened. She remembered the sudden furtive sense of glee she had felt on seeing the gnome's shattered form. Realizing that it was the wish song that had destroyed it, she had reveled for that single instant in the power of the magic. What kind of monster has she let herself become? Her eyes snapped open. She had not let herself become anything. The Grim Pond was right. You did not use the magic. The magic used you. The magic made you what it would. She could not fully control it. She had discovered that in the encounter at the Rooker Line Trading Center with the men from west of Spanning Ridge and had promised herself that she would never lose control of the magic like that again. And when the spider gnomes had come at her, as she fled through their encampment, such control as she had thought to exercise had quickly evaporated under the flood of her emotions and the confusion and urgency of the moment. She had used the magic without any real presence of mind at all, but had simply reacted, wielding the power as Ron Leo would wield his sword, a terrible, destructive weapon, and she had enjoyed it. Tears formed at the corner of her eyes. She could argue that the enjoyment had been momentary and tinged with guilt, that her horror at its being would prevent it from reoccurring, but the truth could not be avoided. The magic had proven to be dangerously unpredictable. It had affected her behavior in ways she would not have thought possible. That made it a threat, not only to her, but to those close to her and she must guard carefully against that threat. She knew that she could not turn aside from her journey eastward to the male moored. Alanin had given her a trust, and she knew that, despite everything that had happened and all that argued against it, she must fulfill that trust. 
she believed that even now, but even though she was bound by the need she saw, she could yet choose her own code of being. Alanin had intended that the wish song be put to a single use, to gain Bren entry into the pit. She must find a way, therefore, to keep the magic to herself until it was time to call upon it for that intended use. Only once more was she risk using the magic. Determined, she brushed the tears from her eyes. It would be as she had sworn. The magic would use her no more. She straightened. Now she must find her way back to the others. She stumbled forward again, groping ahead through the gloom, her direction uncertain. Trailers of mist slipped past her, and in their meandering movement, she was surprised to discover images. They crowded about her, drawn from the haze into her mind and out again. The images began to take the shapes and forms of memories, resurrected from her childhood. Her mother and her father passed before her, larger in memory than in life, in their warmth and security, gentle figures that sheltered and loved. Jared was there. Shadows slipped through the strange, empty half-light. Ghosts of the past. Alana might be one of those ghosts. Come from death to the living. She looked to find him, half expecting. And suddenly, shockingly, he was there. Come from the mist like the shade he now was. He stood barely a dozen yards distant. Gray haze all about him. Swirling like the haze horn stirred to life. Alanin, she whispered, yet she hesitated. The shape belonged to Alanin, but it was the mist, only the mist. The shadow that was Alanin slipped back into the gloom, gone, as it had never really been, gone. And yet there had been something after all, not Alanin, but something else. Swiftly she glanced about, searching for the thing sensing somehow that it was out there, watching her. Images danced again before her eyes, born on the trailers of mist, reflections of her memory. The mist gave them life, a magic that entranced and lured. She stood transfixed in their wake and wondered momentarily if she were indeed going mad. Such imaginings as she was experiencing were certainly indicative of madness. And yet she felt herself clear-headed and sure. It was the mist that sought to seduce her, teasing her with its musings, playing with her memories. As if they were its own, it was the mist or something in the mist. Where beast? The word whispered from somewhere back in her consciousness. Cogline had warned of the mist things as... The little company had crouched within the rocks on the ridge line overlooking the camp of the spider gnomes. Scattered all about old and more, they preyed on beings weaker than they, snaring them, draining away their lives. She straightened, hesitated, then slowly began to walk ahead. Something moved in the mist with her, a shadow, dim and not fully formed, a bit of night, a werebeast. She hastened on, letting her feet take her where they could. She was hopelessly lost, but she could not stay away, but she could not stay where she was. She must keep moving. She thought of those who had left her behind. Would they be searching for her? Would they be able to find her in this wall of mist? She shook her head doubtfully. She could not depend on that. She must find her own way out. Somewhere ahead, the wall of mist would fade and the moor would end. She must simply walk until she was out of it, free of its numbing haze. But what if it would not let her get free? Her memories came to life once more in the trailers of mist and that swirled about her, teasing and seductive. She walked faster, ignoring them, aware as somewhere. Just beyond her vision, the shadow kept pace. A chill settled through her at the awareness of the other. She tried to envision the thing that followed her. What manner of creature was the werebeast? It had come to her as a lanin, or had that merely been a trick of the mist and her imagination? She shook her head in voiceless confusion. Something small and wet skittered away from beneath her feet, flittering off into the dark. She turned away from it, moving down a broad incline into a vast, 
marshy bowl. Muck and swamp sucked at her boots, and wintry grasses slapped at her legs, clutching. She slowed, sensing the unpleasant give in the ground, then backed away toward the room again. Quicksand lay at the bottom of that bowl, and it would draw her down and swallow her. She must stay away, stay clear of it, and follow the harder, drier earth. Mist swirled thickly all about, obscuring her vision as she sought to see her way clear. Still, she had no sense of direction. For all she knew, she had been traveling in a circle. She tramped on. The mists of old and more swirled and thickened in the deep night about her, and shadows moved through their dampened haze. Where beast? There was more than one of them trailing her now. Bryn stared out at them, following their quick silver movements as they swam like fish through twilight waters. Grimly, she quickened her pace, slipping through the marsh grass, keeping to the high ground. They still came after her, but they would not have her. She swore in silent promise. She belonged to another fate. She hastened onward, running now, the pumping of her heart and blood, a dull pound in her ears, Anger, fear, and determination all mingled as one and drove her forward. The moor rose before her gently, and she scrambled to the center of a small rise, thick with long grasses and scrub. Slowing, she glanced about in disbelief. The shadows were everywhere. Then a tall, lean figure appeared from out of the mist before her, Wrapped in a Highlander's cloak and bearing a giant broad sword strapped across its back. Bryn stiffened in surprise. It was Roan. Arms lifted from out of the robes, reaching for her, beckoning her close. Willingly, she started forward toward the Highlander, her hand stretching to take his. And then something stopped her. She blinked. Roan? No. A red veil fell across her vision, rage sweeping through her as she recognized the deception. It was not Ron Leia, she saw. It was again the werebeast that tracked her. It came forward, a shimmering and fluid apparition. Robes and sword fell away, bits of the mist through which it passed. Nothing of the Highlander was there now, but only a shadow, huge and changing. Swiftly, it drew together a massive body, crouched on thick, clawed hind legs, great forearms crooked and bristling with shaggy hair, and a head wrinkled and twisted about jaws that split to reveal whitened teeth. It rose up through the mist, twice her size, swathed in the moor's haze. Soundless, it bent its head and snapped at her. A mass of hair and scales, muscles, spiked bone, teeth, and slitted eyes. It was a thing born of darkest nightmares. One Brim might have dreamed in the anguish of her own despair. Was it real? Or was it simply born out of the mist and the wanderings of her imagination? It made no difference. Forsaking the oath she had taken only minutes earlier, she used the witch stone, hardened with purpose, maddened by what she saw. She called it forth. She was not meant to die here within Old and Moor at the hands of this monster. This one further time she would use the magic on a thing whose destruction did not matter. She sang and the wish song froze in her throat. It was her father who stood before her now. The werebee slouched toward her, form shifting and changing in the haze, jaws slobbering in anticipation of how the veil girl's life was sate its needs. Bryn staggered back, seeing now her mother's dark and gentle face. She called out in desperation a wild, anguishly anguished cry that seemed locked in the silence of her mind. Back came an answering cry, calling her name. Bryn! Confusion swept through her. The cry seemed real, but who? Bryn! The monster loomed over her, and she could smell the evil of it. But the wish Sean stayed locked in her throat. Imprisoned by the image she retained of its power tearing into her mother's slim form, leaving it broken and lifeless. Bryn! Then a frightened roar shattered the stillness of the night. A sleek shadow flew out of the mist and 500 pounds of enraged moorcat crashed into the werebeast, flinging it back from Bryn. 
Teeth and claws slashed. The cat tore into the monstrous apparition and both went tumbling headlong through the deep grasses. Bryn, where are you? Bryn stumbled back, barely able to hear the voices over the sounds of the battle. Frantic, she called back to them. An instant later, Kimber appeared, darting through the haze, her long hair streaming out behind her. Cogline followed, shouting wildly, his crooked body struggling to keep pace with the girl. Whisper and the werebeast surged back into view, lunging and fainting. The more cat was the stronger of the two, although the mist thing sought to break past, it was blocked at every turn. But now other shells were gathering in the darkness beyond, huge and shapeless, bringing them all close about. Too many shadows. Leia, Leia! And then Roan was there, his slim form bolting through the mass of shadows, sword lifting. Eerie, green incandescence swirled about the ebony blade. The werebeast con concerned, the werebeast cornered by whisper, whirled instantly, sensing the great danger of the sword's magic. Thrusting away from the moor cat, the monster leaped at Roan, but the Prince of Leia was ready. His sword arced down, knifing through the mist into the werebeast. Green fire flared sharply through the night, and the mist then exploded in a shower of flames. Then the light died away, and the night and the mist returned. The shadows that had gathered in the darkness beyond melted back into the void. The Highlander turned the sword, dropping forgotten at his side. He came quickly to Bryn, his face stricken. I'm sorry, sorry, he whispered. The magic. He shook his head helplessly. When I found the sword again, when I touched it, I couldn't seem to think of anything else. I picked it up and I ran with it. I forgot everything, even you. It was the magic, Bren. He faltered and she nodded into his chest, hugging him close. I know. I won't leave you like that again, he promised. I won't. I know that too, she replied softly. But she said nothing of her decision to leave him. Wow. So that's basically it, guys. We shall see what happens in chapter 37. Uh, wow. She's planning on leaving. I hope she makes a... I hope she doesn't do that. <laughs> but we'll see what happens next time. Okay, guys. Bye.